Uh, I will not do the presentation, I will just introduce uh, uh, <laughs> Maite Melero. Um, we've known each other for 20 years. Uh, we've worked together on machine translation project for uh, low resource uh, languages without parallel data. Um, she's been working on uh, uh, in the private sector with industry in uh, Microsoft. Microsoft Research. She's uh, done the tour of all the Barcelona universities, or nearly all of them. And uh, she's uh, better known probably for her work on the European language equality and uh, white papers on uh, Spanish and Catalan. For you. Thank you. First of all, thank you to Clarin Annual Conference for inviting me. Thank you to Vincent for presenting me and for letting me choose the subject of my speech. I chose a subject that is close to my heart and um, not exactly what I have been working on all the time, but uh, Language diversity and minority languages have always been a big focus for me. So I've been uh, trying to not get too far from them. Okay, so uh, Vincent has already uh, presented me. Just uh, mentioned that uh, I'm currently uh, leading the machine translation uh, research group at the Language Technologies Unit at uh, BSC which is a super computer, uh, computational center. I'm also a member of the board, and here is where my heart lies, uh, of the special interest group on under-resourced languages, SIGUL, uh, which organizes uh, an annual uh, workshop, and also of an NGO called Lingua Pax International, uh, whose uh, goal is also language diversity in the world. And I'm a proud member of the Claria Spain uh, network, and also I'm trying to initiate a Claria uh, Catalonia network. So what I'm going to talk about, uh, basically, first, uh, of the value of language diversity. I hope I'm going to convince you that uh, language diversity has value. Then uh, I'm going to talk about language technologies uh, and their, uh, its latest developments and how they impact on language diversity. And I will end up with a summary of opportunities and challenges for language diversity in this moment. As you can see the, the picture, I just asked ChatGPT, please uh, draw a winding road. And it looks quite nice, but look at that. Uh, is this the, look at the, at the, so it, this is AI, right? It looks uh, nice, but it's not perfect. <laughs> Well, I, I, I had to, to start with the beginning, of course. <laughs> uh, this is the, the actual uh, text from the Bible. It's, it's really interesting, uh, the things that it says. Uh, basically, uh, God, uh, um, God uh, afraid of people uh, having one language uh, that gave them uh, really uh, strength and power and as uh, said here if one if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to begun to do this then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them right so um, what he did was confuse their language so that they will not understand each other Babel in fact is is uh, a Hebrew, it's close to the Hebrew word for confuse, and, and that was the beginning of the, of the language diversity on Earth. So yes, from that time on, language diversity uh, has been seen as a curse, not by, by everybody, but by many. And I bring here two examples. Uh, this uh, monsieur here, 
is uh, Abbe Grégoire. He was a, a French uh, Catholic priest, a, a, a bishop, in fact, uh, and a leader of the French Revolution. He did many good things, but uh, he's mostly known uh, for his obsession of having a unified French national language. And he wrote this report here uh, that uh, I can translate for you, report on the necessity and means to annihilate the patois and to universalize the use of the French language. The word is annihilate, anéantir. And, and, and the other word, the interesting word is patois, which is a little bit pejorative. Uh, and it basically means any language that is not uh, the one that is really important. So th that was the pre uh, a common ide ideology at the time of the, of the French Revolution. In fact, um, the regional languages were seen as an obstacle to progress, uh, very much in, in line with the myth of Babel, right? Uh, if you have many languages, you will not be able to build big things. And this uh, language ideology, uh, uh, which uh, was also important in the 19th century, uh, when state nations be began to define themselves and promote uh, cohesive national identities, one nation, one language, uh, in Europe and in other places in the world, um, really uh, created a, a gap between, uh, between languages, the first-rate uh, languages and second-rate. And it's, uh, very, this, this ideology is, is, is still uh, around. As an example, I have uh, here uh, an article published in a Spanish um, newspaper in 2022. And I will, I will, go in, I will uh, translate for you the title and subtitle. Is um, the essential inequality of languages? This is the title, and uh, subtitle is languages are not equal in their ability to serve as a means of communication. The fact that one given language allows communication with more people makes it a better system. Okay. Okay. Those are the haters. Let's go for the supporters. <laughs> so uh, back in 2021 or 22, uh, no, 21, uh, Lingua Pax asked me to coordinate a special issue uh, of its annual review on the subject precisely of uh, language technologies and language diversity. And um, I contacted several uh, people and one of my authors was uh, a Spanish linguist, a professor uh, in the Uni Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, uh, Juan Carlos Moreno Cabrera, who is um, a, a well-known supporter of language equality and also a debunker of the myths of linguistic supremacy. He's a rare, rare avis in the, <laughs> in the uh, Spanish uh, university, at least in Madrid. But. And um, so, uh, as you can see from this uh, fragment, uh, from his contribution to my special issue, um, it, it clearly states his, his, uh, his position. And, well, interestingly, I asked him for an article on the impact of technology on language diversity, and he uh, offered to write one on the impact of language diversity on technology. So the, the subject of his contribution uh, was uh, about um, evolution of writing, writing being a technology, one of the oldest. And his thesis was that uh, whenever a language adapted a writing system coming from another language that had a completely different phonological system, the writing system evolves and becomes more efficient. And for example, there are several examples in his article, but one uh, example is what happened uh, with the evolution of the Phoenician alphabet, uh, which is a Semitic language and has no vowels, uh, or not expressed vowels, uh, to Greek. So Greek, the Greek alphabet, uh, which is at the base of, of uh, most of our alphabets, like uh, Latin, Cyrillic, etc., uh, was an evolution, a clever evolution uh, from the uh, Phoenician alphabet, being the two languages very far apart. And I'm going to bring another supporter from my um, uh, special issue, and this is um, Stephen Bird, 
whom you will have the, the opportunity and the privilege uh, uh, of listening to on Thursday in this conference. So Stephen uh, contributed with an inspiring piece from which this fragment is taken, very, very beautiful, and can be summarized uh, as uh, really uh, appreciating that language is identity, is country, it's even title to land, like the, the story about, um, about um, uh, the people uh, not wanting to stop or, or, or um, fearing to, to, to lo lose their language because they will be chased off their land. Or um, every uh, uh, story from a different, uh, um, in a different language cannot be told uh, because it's from another country. Um, this uh, article from, from Stephen uh, also uh, provides a, a, a series of concrete actions that everybody can take to help create a world that celebrates uh, language diversity. I'm going to mention some. For example, um, learn to speak the original language of your place. Let's say you live in California. Learn the original language of that specific county in California or raised bilingual children, if you come from, from more than one language, or simply learn to greet people in their language, or learn to pronounce their names. This is something that um, most of us don't do <laughs> first. Or even play language games. So, and um, after uh, mentioning these uh, two modern supporters, uh, I want to pay tribute uh, to, to two pioneers. And one of them is Edward Sapir. He was an American linguist and anthropologist. He was born in 1884 and was deceased in 1931, so goes uh, quite far back. And, he's, and I wanted to bring him here because this a little booklet, not very big, uh, is, the, is the book that um, uh, made me uh, study what I'd studied and work uh, uh, in, the, in the field that I worked and, and make me fall in love with language forever. So this is a really a, a magical uh, book. It's called Language and it describes his experience as anthropologist on the field among Native Americans. And he was uh, one of the first um, to mention the concept that language influences thought. And uh, this concept was later incorporated by um, one of the most prestigious ph philosophers of the 20th century, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein um, argues, likewise, that language shapes our understanding of the world. So language is not just a means of communication, as the previous gentleman pre pretended, but is culture, is a connection to the history of the community that's, that speaks that language, and is a worldview shared by that community. So in that light, uh, just losing what la one language is losing a whole worldview, right? And you have seen this before, but I thought that it, it, it would be interesting to give a quick overview of how language diversity was across time. So um, starting from prehistoric, prehistoric uh, times or early human societies, say before 3000 before Christ, was at the peak of language diversity. Uh, while po human population was probably at, a, at its l lowest. L lowest. Um, it's uh, estimated that, uh, that at around uh, 3,000 before Christ, uh, there must have been between 14 and 35 million people, which is less, much less than the uh, modern population in Spain. And uh, if we want to calculate how many languages were spoken by these people, we can look at uh, the ratio uh, of uh, 
people and language in, in today's hunter-gatherer populations, for example, in Papua Nueva Gu New Guinea, which is uh, between uh, 1,000 and 2,000 people per language. If we project this uh, onto this uh, estimation of population, we may end, end up with a number around 7,000 languages in, in these early human societies, which is approximately the number of languages that are spoken today. And I think the ratio of, uh, yeah, the, the population has grown three, uh, 320 times, okay? So uh, at that time, all these, uh, each one of these 7,000 languages had the same opportunity to, to persist uh, and, and continue existing. Um, so going uh, forward in history, um, something uh, very important happened is the, uh, the advent of writing and uh, through that some languages gained prominence uh, as administrative languages, literary languages, and they began to spread beyond their original regions at the expense of, of the local languages of these other regions, right? So we start to see how uh, the diversity starts to 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 to, to, to risk uh, as, uh, or to diminish. Uh, one example of this is Latin, of course, uh, which became the dominant language across the Western Roman Empire, while Greek became the dominant language of the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. But then uh, the Roman Empire fell, and uh, it was a sort of uh, go, going back to, to previous situation. Interestingly, uh, Latin uh, fragmented uh, uh, with the influence with, of, uh, of uh, westward uh, migrations from Germanic and Slavic uh, populations. Also, the Germanic languages uh, fragmented, uh, and, and this happened uh, a little bit in many places. Um, so it was a period of increased diversity, but um, with uh, some languages that we can call classical languages, such as Latin, Greek, or Arabic, that were used uh, as lingua francas to maintain unity, uh, for example, religious unity, or to, to be used in, 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 in scholar communication, so really by a uh, um, minority uh, part of the society. So that was the situation um, during all the Middle Ages. And then um, Christopher Columbus discovered the American continent in 1492. And uh, there be began the spread of European languages uh, through colonization, specifically Spanish, Portuguese, English, French, and Dutch. Yes, uh, all around the, the globe. Um, yeah, and uh, anecdotically, there were some emergence of new languages which were derived from these uh, European languages uh, through a, an interesting um, mechanism, linguistic mechanism called creolization where um, when pe populations that don't uh, share the same language start using a very basic language uh, that contains um, elements of, of, of several or at least two. And this is called pidgin. It's a basic, uh, very basic language. But when, uh, when children are raised uh, with a pidgin as a first language, this Pidgin turns into a full-fledged, stable language called Creole. And those are the languages that are uh, today speak, spoken in, uh, in Caribbean islands, such as Jamaica and others, mostly based on English or some uh, on French, like Haitian. And going forward, um, we get to the Industrial Revolution. OK, the Industrial Revolution had uh, some uh, important social uh, phenomena. One of them was the big rural to urban migration within, the, within the, each country. Um, that uh, caused that people uh, speaking um, 
different dialects or different varieties uh, left their hometown and got together in, in a city where they met, they mingled, they spoke. And, and this uh, was a factor also of uh, homogenization um, for many languages. And another uh, important um, factor was that education started to become uh, compulsory. And children at school uh, were um, obliged uh, to speak the standard uh, language and forget about the variants, patois, regional languages, etc. And it was like um, enforced with uh, very uh, with very uh, strong methods. So that was really a, a, a crucial factor. Uh, for um, losing uh, diversity in, in, in many uh, countries, Western countries. And of course, in the Western countries, there was the colonization factor. So everything uh, was helping to um, optimize the number of languages, meaning um, the less, the better. And finally, uh, after the, 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 the wars uh, in, in the 20th century, um, there is one language that uh, really rises to the top. Um, this is English. And we will <laughs> mention this several times along this presentation. And also, during the, this uh, century, uh, there are the first signs of awareness of this uh, loss of languages and loss of language diversity and the start of preservation efforts or at least documentation efforts, which is not exactly the same. But So for example, three small stories of, it's always interesting to, 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 to see the people um, that were the last speakers of a language, like you put a name in a, in, in the extinction of a language, right? So the first story is about uh, this uh, Edward Sapper, the, lang the linguist I mentioned before. And he worked uh, with Ishii, who was a monolingual speaker of, uh, of Yahi, um, a language uh, of uh, California. And, um, and they worked together, uh, not for um, long, because he, he died uh, quite young uh, in 1916, but at least like a couple of years. And as a result, uh, this, is, this is one of the most, uh, the best documented languages uh, in, of, of, of that area, thanks to, to Yahi. Um, the second story is uh, a guy called Alf Palmer. He died in, in just 1981. And he was not monolingual, probably, but he was very anxious for his language to be preserved. So he was uh, eager to work with uh, linguists, and, they, and he told them repeatedly uh, what I have written here. I am the last one to speak Warungu. This is a, um, an Australian Aboriginal language. When I die, he was uh, very aware that when, when I die, his, this language will die. I'll teach you everything I know, so put it down properly. And finally, uh, the, the last story is, is about um, a woman. We don't have the, the, the photograph, but we have this picture. Uh, she was called Dolly Pentreth, and she was the, the last native speaker of Cornish and died in 1777. So Cornish, after her death, uh, was extinct. But uh, in the early 20th century, uh, probably it was well documented, uh, a revival movement began and it started to be taught in schools. And nowadays, uh, there are uh, families that are raising children as native Cornish speakers. So an interesting story of um, um, revitalization or resurrection or I don't know. Okay, 
So now a parallelism that uh, people working in language um, diversity is very willing to, to make. Because biological diversity uh, has a good rap. Uh, mm, few people is, few people, uh, is against biological diversity. They are, uh, they agree to any efforts, principle that can be done about that. So this is a parallelism that would benefit the community of uh, supporters of language diversity. And in fact, the parallelism is quite, uh, quite clear. I mean, um, in one case, we are talking about extinction of languages and the other extinction of biological species. But in both cases, there is irrepla irreplaceable knowledge that is lost. In, in one case, we have impact on communities. In the other, we have impact on ecosystems. Both are caused by human impact. Um, as uh, I have, I, I say here, taken from this, this book, um, this is the same fight. Colonization, resource exploitation, and economic globalization is at the root of the destruction of languages and the destruction of ecosystems. So both um, deserve efforts to preserve and revive. In fact, this book, I just ran into it a couple of very few days ago because it has been translated into Catalan. The author is, is um, uh, Icelandic. Uh, she's a, a woman and it's a poetic book. I haven't read it. I want to read it. Um, Mm, but anyway, the, 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 the story is a linguist who decides to grow a forest on barren land. And there is a sort of parallelism going on between this uh, forest being grown on a, on a land that is barren and a language that is struggling to survive, such as um, Icelandic. Okay, so what's the situation uh, today in the world? As I was saying, there are approximately 7,168 living languages. Uh, this is taken from Ethnolog via Wikipedia, because uh, you need to pay to consult uh, Ethnolog directly, but Wikipedia gives some information. So I looked at this up. This is from uh, 2024. And this um, pie chart shows you the like the distribution of, of these seven, little bit over 7,000 languages in, uh, according to number of speakers. So, uh, the, this part here, these are languages that, are, that have less than one million speakers, but this one are languages that have less than 1,000 speakers. So, Really, this small part of the chart are languages with 1 to 10 million, 10 to 100 million, or over 100 million. So, as you can see, uh, very unbalanced. And this, uh, of course, has consequences. The other, um, the other tables show um, this table in, in blue here uh, shows the total number of speakers uh, when counting not just native language, but also a second language. And here, English dominates. It has um, like, well, 1.5 billion speakers, something like that. Then comes Chinese, then comes Hindi, Spanish, French, and standard Arabic. The other table is similar, but just uh, takes into account native speakers of the languages. Here, the languages, uh, there are some that, that are, don't appear, and there are new ones that appear, and there are some changes in the ranking. But basically, three of them are the same. It's Chinese, that now is the first one, then Spanish, then English, Hindi, Hindi was also there, so four. Then it's Bengali and Portuguese. Well, taking all this together means that uh, one out of two people on Earth speaks one of six languages. 
And if we just look at uh, native speakers, it's one out of three. So of course, for practical people, uh, these, these arguments, these tables alone, uh, would be an argument to get rid of the problem of diversity. I mean, it's clear that um, it's a problem that uh, we are just willing to, to make, but we want. Uh, and if that was uh, languages spoken in the world, if we look at the, at the web, so the digital um, image of the world, we see that the imbalance is even bigger, much bigger. This graph uh, shows, it's, it's taken from Statista as of January 2024, and these are the languages most frequently used for web content. So if we are to believe this, this graph, 52% uh, of, uh, of the web content is in English. And the rest go very, very uh, far behind. It's true that when the web just started, English, I think, was the 80% 80, the 80 of the content was in English. So it has uh, been reduced. And if you, go, if you look at other sources, some of them say that it's not 50% in English, it's like around 30%. I don't know. Uh, it's true. And, and it needs to be said that there has been an increase in the number of websites in other languages. So the web has little by little become more multilingual. Okay. Um, yeah, but English uh, merits a special chapter because English is our global lingua franca. And lingua francas, we have had uh, several across history or throughout history, for example, Latin, depending on the, on the, on the part of the world, Persian, uh, Spanish, French, German. But today, English dominates both geographically and across domains. And well, uh, it was interesting for me to find this uh, article in the Times Higher Education because it shows the impact uh, that, uh, that this fact has on native speakers. And so this, uh, the first, um, the title of the, of the article was, is AI the final nail in the coffin for modern languages? Well, it's not AI, it's English as lingua franca. <laughs> because the first, um, the first uh, table uh, shows uh, how the, um, the um, students of, uh, modern languages, the, 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 how the trend in modern language enrollment has gone in, in three different English-speaking countries. Uh, the US, here, this is the US, this is the UK, and this is Australia. Australia seems like less affected, right? But the, in the US, uh, from 2010 to two, 2022, it has ex experienced a, a big drop and also in the UK. In fact, the, 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 um, this, uh, this journal is, is, was worried about the UK because it's, it was a, a, a British journal, but the, the situation in the US is, is even worse. And this is something that uh, doesn't replicate in, in other non-English speaking countries. For example, to compare, uh, we have the trends in Germany. In Germany, the trend goes up for English and for a little bit for Spanish and a little bit for Chinese while the others go down. So those are the trends. People learning languages in the world, those are the trends. And now let's look at the impact on other languages, especially uh, in English uh, being uh, the undisputed lingua franca of science. Um, yeah, the green uh, the fragment is an article published in, back in 2016, and the title is uh, The Effect on Citation Rate of Using Languages Other Than English in Scientific Publications. The effect was negative, so very, 
clearly uh, publishing in other in languages other than English um, had a bad impact on on the on the paper in question. And then uh, there was a report because the yeah the. So the, the scientific uh, or the, the institutions working for the Spanish and the Portuguese languages are worried about about this phenomenon, and they and there was a report uh, that showed that, uh, to no surprise, 95 percent of all work published in journals uh, was in English, and only one what five minutes <laughs> really okay. Most of my presentations, <laughs> so, so forget. Well, you, you, you see the problem, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I've been involved in, 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 in this kind of, of subjects since uh, several years ago. The first uh, person to, to, to um, it's my English, I'm too slow. Okay, uh, Andras Korn, I guess um, uh, some of you know him. Uh, he's a, an Hungarian a mathematician, and he predicted that less than 5% uh, of languages will ascend to the, to the digital realm. We were talking about the digital age, uh, because that was before ChatGPT. Now we talk about AI age, okay? But that, already at that time, um, there, it was clear that digital diglossia would be a problem for speakers of minority languages, because we were starting to speak to our, our machines. We were starting to use a human language to communicate with machines. And at that point, uh, the question is, we'll need, we will need to change our language to talk to our um, washing machine or what? So, because at that point, in, 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 in 2015, 2016, 2017, the prospects were not good for most of the languages. It was, they were good for English and good for a handful of, of other languages, four or five, that's it. So then ChatGPT took the world by storm. And um, so whatever impact uh, digitalization, digitalization was having 10 years ago, this is now going to accelerate. But the good news is that this AI revolution has brought a, a certain degree of multilingualism that was unprecedented. And that was the second part of my presentation. Well, you need to invite me next year. <laughs> OK, so maybe I'm going to skip this. Uh, there was a long road to chat GPT that started in the 60s. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, funny um, piece of, of, of um, article published in 1960, where there were great expectations and, and people with a machine uh, would uh, be sp speaking with uh, one another in their own languages. Okay, this is something that is not that far away now, and it's maybe one of the hopes that language diversity uh, can have. This is my spoiler here. Well, so, and the story goes, at the beginning there were rules, then data came to the rescue by bilinguists, but the data always is skewed. Remember the graphic from the web? That has been uh, our doom. Okay, and then, uh, do you know this um, gentleman here? He has just won the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, his name is Geoffrey uh, Hinton, and uh, he's at the root of this revolution because uh, he was the, the few, one of the few people that uh, continued to work on one type of algorithm called neural network for years and years. Uh, since the 80s, nobody paid any attention to him. But then, uh, with the uh, uh, GPUs coming from the video games and, and with uh, a lot of digital data around, he, he put everything together, uh, neural networks on one hand, on one side, uh, uh, um, computation, high uh, computing uh, for, on the other, and then uh, big data, and all together, uh, the magic. And, and in 2017, this is the other uh, big landmark. This is uh, where the transformer uh, was uh, presented by a group of um, researchers uh, from Google. And the, the transformer uh, was a uh, machine translation architecture uh, supposed to, to translate better because it was able to keep a, large, a larger context. 
But the, the smart thing that happened later is that they applied uh, this architecture to translate to learn a, one language. By, and how did they do it? Um, they trained their systems uh, by hiding or masking parts of the sentence and um, trained the system to reconstruct these sentences, to predict what came later or to fill in the gaps. And that uh, produced uh, the first large language models that was um, BERT in 2018 and GPT-3 in 2020. And uh, this, uh, these are different families of, 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 uh, of large language models. Um, this, uh, is, this takes the first part of the transformer, the part that encodes, and this one is, takes the, the part that decodes and uh, is the start of the generative AI as we know it today. And an interesting aspect of these large language models is that they are multilingual either by nature or by, or by chance, because the, their multilingualism is almost anecdotal. This is the, with GPT-3, uh, mo mo most large language models now don't disclose the composition of their training corpus, but uh, GPT-3, they, they did that. It, it came in, in, it was published, as I say, in 2020, and this is the distribution of languages. So you see not more than 90% uh, in English, but the good news was, uh, that uh, now it was easier to incorporate new languages in, in a field that for many, many, many years had focused only in English. And this was thanks to the magic of transfer learning, right? So before language, uh, large language models, to train uh, a system, to train uh, a model for, for uh, a task, you needed a lot of um, annotated data. And that was very costly, and that was accessible to very few languages. But now, uh, what we find is that uh, we build these uh, large language models with unlabeled data, just raw text, right? And then, with much smaller amounts of labeled data, we can fine tune them, even uh, we can uh, use them uh, without any training, like in the zero shot uh, scenarios. And most important for our, our subject today is the cross-lingual transfer learning. So the, the knowledge uh, that has been uh, distillated from the high resource language can be leveraged to improve quality for low resource languages. And I'm going to skip this. I wanted to just mention that uh, when GPT-3 appeared, two years before uh, chat, no, one GPT-3, eh? which is at the base of ChatGPT. So before it, it went uh, really, uh, it was famous, uh, in the research community, we started to see the, the, the abilities. I mean, we were working in a project for Catalan resources. Catalan was like a mid-resource language, and we wanted uh, to speak Catalan to our uh, washing machine, so we were working on Catalan. And we, we tried a GPT-3, which was a non-instructed model, uh, a poor base model, and it worked so well for Catalan. And, and look here, uh, it had only 0.017% uh, of Catalan, right? One of the tasks that we evaluated was pure uh, generation, and we had humans evaluated. And this, well, uh, we also looked at different uh, sizes of the models, right? And look, this is for English, the results of GPT-3 for English, evaluated by, by three humans and then um, for, um, taken the majority of the vote. And this is for Catalan. So it's, that, that that's, can be considered a Turing test, and it shows a perfect correlation also between the, the size of the model and performance. Look at the smaller model already performs uh, little in English. It doesn't perform at all in Catalan, the smaller model. But the bigger the model, this is human, eh? but the, the bigger the model, and the data is still the same. That tells you a lot of what's going on, right? And well, uh, here is one paper. Uh, the interesting thing here is see that uh, at, uh, from tw uh, 2015, the number of papers for uh, sm uh, small languages, and in this case, indigenous uh, languages of the Americas, started to spike. 
Here is another paper very well known in the, in the area. It's Joshi et al. And this is a very, very interesting paper. Uh, it also shows the difference between two languages here. It's, it's at the beginning of the, of the paper, it says we have a language uh, called X, another called Y. Uh, and this is the number of papers that these conferences um, uh, mention this language. And, the, and there is a big difference between the two, right? And at the end, they disclose that uh, one language is, I think, is Tamil, and the other is Dutch. And, well, this paper is also interesting because it makes this uh, language taxonomy where the left behinds, they don't have no, they don't have data, no raw data, nothing. The scrapping buys have some raw data. The hopefuls also have a small label data set, meaning that there's someone that's taking care of them, and that's very important. Then the rising stars, they have a strong web presence. So they can benefit from, from this transfer learning that we were saying. Then the underdogs that are close to the winners and then the winners. Here, some examples of these categories. And, the, and then he points out that something that is very, very important. The lack, he says, the lack of technology for class zero languages may push people to switch to class five languages. This is what I was mentioning before about the digital diglossia. When a, a, a speaker is not able to use the latest technology, especially a young speaker, ditches the, languages, the language and goes for the big one. This is happening in, in Catalonia, for example, with Spanish, which uh, is close and, and dominant. But it's also happening in, maybe in, in Denmark or in Holland in favor of English if, uh, if the technology is more advanced, right? So, well, yeah. And, well, another interesting thing is that uh, they, they noticed that uh, um, transfer, the, the, the use of transfer learning also depends on that the language uh, share similar topological features with the big languages. And then all those languages that, that, don't, that have rare typological features are really at the bottom of the, of the list. Well, uh, then we started to have the first multilingual translation models, mostly uh, developed by Meta. Language models are getting larger and larger, and some of them more diverse. Just let me mention here, Bloom was a first uh, attempt at an open source uh, language model uh, with uh, more uh, diversity of languages, far from the 90% of GPT-3. And this one uh, is, one, uh, is, is the, the composition of the training corpus for one model uh, that uh, the BSC has uh, very recently released, also open source. It's called Salamandra, and it has been um, um, uh, developed in the context of the AINA project, uh, which is a government-sponsored uh, uh, government, uh, uh, project for Catalan language, language resources. And the budget is uh, incredible. I mean, uh, we have had, uh, let me see. I don't want to get this wrong. Uh, OK, uh, 30, over 30 million euros to develop uh, resources for Catalan. This is quite uh, amazing. And um, Ilenia is from the Spanish government, and, and it's uh, been supporting this project and all other projects in, in for the for other languages in Spain. Also, uh, people are, are are developing multilingual data sets, more diverse. Well, I also wanted to mention that even though the the AI is becoming more multilingual. Uh, uh, we need to be careful uh, that this, uh, that they perform so well in Danish, in Catalan, in Greek, but there may be some uh, cultural, um, 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 how to say, biases or trends uh, hidden in that in the in the, in, the, in, the, in those models because the 
the massive amount of, of um, training uh, data in, in, other, in, in, ling in English, basically. So this also exists. And this is a paper from August, from like one month ago, uh, quantifying uh, these, uh, these bias. Also very interesting, something to follow. So opportunities and challenges. Um, so the good things. Many languages have joined English in crossing the digital divide compared to 2013. That's because they benefit from cross-lingual transfer learning. They have a reasonable internet presence. They have a research community behind them and or they get support from the public administration. If they have all, perfect. If they have some, it's okay. Then uh, we have AI powered MT uh, really uh, high, quali high quality MT um, as a tool for multilingualism. Um, we think that it can be an alternative to lingua franca, um, so giving better chances to other languages. Um, it, it has been used to adapt existing NLP resources in English with the risk that this entails in the sense that we are like uh, not using really native data, but okay. Uh, it helps, uh, in that sense, it helps with the creation of synthetic data. Because uh, these systems are so data hungry uh, and data is not easily found, uh, there's a lot of, of, of data being created synthetically. Okay, uh, and now the, the, the challenges. So those languages that don't have any of the good things that I was mentioning, we need to, to, to consider also them. Think about the digital diglossia that make uh, go, the speakers go from one language to another. And uh, take into account the, culture, the, the cultural bias. And uh, so the final thoughts is basically, I don't know if the, the la language or cultural diversity will uh, th uh, thrive in the next years, but uh, I, I have to say that the opportunities are much bigger than we, ha we have thought just five years ago, at least for, me, for European um, small and medium languages. Um, the rest uh, have formidable challenges, and well, no, not the rest, all have for, uh, formidable challenges. Some can be addressed with proper awareness and action, mainly for all, all of us. And I just wanted to end with an invitation for this uh, conference, uh, Language Technologies for All. Uh, is, this is the second edition, first edition was uh, five years ago, and it will uh, be in Paris, and we are organizing it. And thank you. And sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm very sorry to have to uh, cut you off so uh, brutally. We should have given you a two-hour slot. Um, um, so, but we have time for one question at least. Um, so, if there's a question. Um, we have time for one question. Yes, okay. I have a provocative question. Yes, uh, yes. For languages of type zero, so the ones that have no hope, so to say, wouldn't it be that maybe in the future, because they are uh, as such, they have an advantage? Uh, because uh, now uh, more and more of the content that we will access online, we don't know if it's uh, generated <laughs> artificially or if it's actually human, uh, humanly produced. But if you read or if you access some content in one of those languages that are so under resources that there aren't, the, the language models don't work for them, we can actually be sure that we are uh, accessing content from a human being. So I don't know if he, someone has an, had any thought about this, because I was reading about the fact that uh, soon enough, uh, half of even more of the content that we will access online will be artificially generated. So maybe we want to have these languages kept as such, I don't know, or maybe not. 
Yeah, the problem is that these languages, uh, if they don't exist in the in the digital world, they they don't exist. But yeah, yeah, it's interesting because uh, some years ago, um, all the spam and phishing and, and and all this kind of uh, stuff uh, was always in at least in in, in, Spain, in Spanish, bad Spanish if you want, or English. But now it's in perfect Catalan. So you, it's very very difficult to to find that uh, has been yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Maite. Um...